Good morning and welcome to the First Baptist Church of Rust Sunday Morning Bible Study. I'm Larry Sinclair. It's my privilege to bring this Bible study to you. And we're going to be looking at some verses from the uh, second chapter of First Thessalonians. Uh, we'll be looking at the uh, beginning of verse 13. But if you've got a scripture device available or a Bible, uh, turn to First Thessalonians chapter 2, and we'll begin reading in a moment from verse 13. Uh, thank you for tuning in to this Bible study. This is a ministry of First Baptist Church of Rusk. We uh, <clears throat> encourage anyone who can, is able to, uh, to go in person to a Sunday school group, a Bible study group on Sunday mornings, but <clears throat> for those that cannot, for whatever reason, we have this uh, this uh, ministry available and it's my privilege to be a part of it. Let's pray together now. <clears throat> Father, it is a joy to read your word, study it, ponder it, uh, try to dig into it to, to uh, uh, let you reveal to us uh, truths that we may have missed in the past and uh, that are needed today in our lives. So I pray that you'll help me as I try to share impressions that you've given me as I uh, prepared this Bible study and I pray that you'll open the hearts and minds of uh, any who hear this Bible study that they might receive and that your your uh, Holy Spirit that you dear Holy Spirit might quicken it and may it come alive in their hearts and their minds and in their lives I pray this in Jesus name Amen <clears throat> All right. We're going to dive right into verse 13 of First Thessalonians chapter 2. You remember that Paul uh, and his companions, who included at least Silas and Timothy, probably perhaps uh, Dr. Luke and maybe others, they had ministered in Thessalonica, which is in um, the modern-day Greece, northern Greece. It was called that part of uh, of that country at that time, because that's part of Europe, was known as Macedonia. Uh, the lower part of modern day Greece was known as um, Acacia. And uh, uh, so Thessalonia is there. Uh, and um, Paul uh, had ministered there for at least three weeks, maybe a little longer. It mentions in Scripture in the book of Acts that on three successive Sabbath days that he taught and reasoned in the synagogues with the Jewish leaders. And we know that uh, uh, on, uh, on other days of the week that he undoubtedly was preaching and teaching wherever he could, wherever he could spread the gospel. Uh, and he'd been there a relatively short time, and, uh, and uh, the, the Jewish Orthodox Jewish religious leaders who were antagonistic to the gospel of Jesus <clears throat> and the idea that Jesus was the Messiah had, uh, had uh, stirred up such a, a mob of people, uh, near do wells I would call them, that uh, could be uh, influenced uh, to oppose and start a riot. And Paul had had to slip out of town. He and the others had had to leave. Thessalonica and uh, head on down further south and uh, later uh, fairly a fairly short time later uh, he was able to write uh, this letter to the Thessalonians the Christians who had, had been converted there they had begun uh, a church and, and and they were they were thriving they were growing in their faithfulness to God and they were ministering and their reputation was spreading. And so Paul had written this letter to them to try to encourage them. And let's pick up at verse 13 of chapter 2. This is why we constantly thank God because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as it truly is the word of God which also works effectively in you who believe. I want to stop at that point and just 
reflect on the reality that the Word of God is living and it is powerful. Uh, the uh, scripture that I thought of when I read this is Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. It says, For the Word of God is living and active, <clears throat> sharper than any double edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It, the Word of God, judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So it's, it's talking about the, the Word of God, it says that it, Scripture, the Word of God, is living. It's alive. It's alive because God is alive. Jesus is alive. The Holy Spirit, who inspired the writer of Hebrews to record uh, these words in a letter to the, to the Jewish Christians uh, back uh, in, in his day. Uh, and uh, it's just verifying that the Word of God is powerful. And it will cut to the very soul, uh, the very uttermost being of any human being. It penetrates us and uh, it judges our thoughts and our attitudes. So the Word of God that Paul has, speaks of here in the, in the letter to the Thessala, Thessalonians is that the Word of God was working effectively in them. He goes ahead and says, in you who believe. I think that's important to note because <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the Word of God is uh, discerned by the children of God, by Christians, uh, through the enabling of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, uh, a verse that uh, points that out uh, would be in uh, First uh, Corinthians chapter two. Find it. I had it marked. I do. Uh, that says uh, we have. Uh, no, it says the man without the spirit. That is a non-believer, a non-Christian, uh, an unsaved person, a man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And what that is saying is that until a lost person is saved, is born again, becomes a Christian, becomes indwelled with the Holy Spirit of God, he really can't make much sense out of the Bible, out of Scripture, because he doesn't have the Holy Spirit within him to, to guide him into all truth, into an understanding of the truth. The Bible, there are many parts of the Bible that are very difficult to understand, and, uh, and, and, and so much of it I don't understand. In fact, uh, what little... I understand uh, from Scripture and uh, about God uh, only scratches the surface. However, I would remind myself and anyone who thinks, "Well, uh, I don't know," to you know, I don't, I just don't know. I don't understand uh, a lot of the Bible. I don't know how to deal with it. We should remember uh, Philippians uh, chapter three which says, verse 16, only let us live up to what we have already attained. In other words, uh, we just need to be obedient to the part of the Bible that we do understand, that God has enabled us to understand, and He will keep on as we desire for Him to, as we study, as we pray, as we ask for His guidance. He will... He will uh, help us to understand more and more of Scripture. But uh, this Scripture here in verse 13 that says, The Word of God works effectively in you who believe. 
and the Holy Spirit, even an unbeliever, uh, the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to bring people, bring unsaved people to salvation, to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, the Holy Spirit uses Scripture, uses the Bible, uses people like you and like like myself to to uh, share the Word of God, share the Gospel to those who are lost and and uh, so the word of God is vitally important there <clears throat> now reading on verse 14 for you brothers and sisters became imitators of God's churches in Jesus Christ that are in Judea since you have also suffered the thing, same thing from people of your own country just as they did from the Jews suffered from the Jews so he's re Paul is saying that you here uh, there in, in Thessalonica uh, are being persecuted uh, and hindered in, in the faith by uh, Jewish leaders who are opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the same thing that has happened back in Judah, in Jerusalem. Uh, and and uh, remember, that was where uh, Paul, uh, at that time, uh, an unbeliever and actually a, a, a very active persecutor of the church actually held the clothing, clothing of those who stoned and killed uh, Stephen, uh, one of the uh, early followers of Jesus and preachers and apostles. And so uh, uh, he was saying, he was just reminding the Thessalonians that they're undergoing the same type of persecution and actually from the same source, that is from the Orthodox Jews who, who felt that salvation was only accomplished through o obeying the Mosaic laws of the Old Testament and who did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah uh, of whom the, the scriptures, Old Testament, prophesied about. Okay, <clears throat> now, he goes on, he's talking about uh, the Jews, verse 15, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us, Paul said. They displease God and are hostile to everyone by keeping us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. So he's very critical, as he should have been, uh, of the Jews uh, back that had had persecuted him, had run him out of uh, uh, Thessalonica as well as before that Philippi uh, in that same region uh, and prevented them from continuing their sharing of the gospel uh, and evangelism there in uh, Thessalonica. And uh, the, that uh, he, he's pointing out that they were hostile. The Jews were hostile to everyone who was trying to spread the gospel, spread the gospel. And so that was a that was an opposition that Paul uh, had experienced really throughout his entire ministry, and it ultimately resulted in his uh, imprisonment and uh, ultimate execution. Uh, was the the Jewish leaders who were so opposed uh, and filled with hate for him and anyone who followed Jesus Christ. So that was, the, that was Paul's main source of uh, adversity during his ministry. Uh, he had been a, right in there with them and, and a part of them and as zealous as anyone of them before his conversion on the road to Damascus when when Jesus uh, struck him down, blinded him with the light of God uh, and, uh, and brought him to a point of brokenness and conversion and acceptance of Christ uh, and placing his faith in Christ. And until that conversion experience, Paul had been as much an enemy of Christians as anyone ever could have been. <clears throat> but um, so the Jewish 
high opposition to Jesus and the gospel of Christ was Paul's primary enemy at the time. I got to thinking about that. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, our, our biggest danger, Christians today, our biggest danger of uh, or our impediment to our uh, faithfully serving God and and uh, spreading the gospel and ministering in the name of Christ, uh, our biggest enemy and danger is not uh, a hostile enemy uh, as much as it really is, I'm afraid, uh, ourselves. We are our biggest enemy. Uh, think about the cartoon uh, years ago of Pogo, and he says, uh, we have met the enemy and it is us. Well, I'm afraid that's the case when it comes to uh, our, our, our lack of commitment to Christ. Uh, uh, we, our biggest enemy is our own self-centered nature. It's not an enemy from outside. Now you may think, well, but there are enemies outside. Yeah, there are. Uh, Satan, of course, is the, is the great enemy. Uh, and uh, he uses anything and everything he can. Scripture says he's like a prowling lion, prowling uh, through the world, trying to see someone to sidetrack, to devour, to get off course, to hinder uh, from becoming a Christian or to hinder in their Christian service. But we are also an enemy. Our own self-centeredness, our own uh, craving, uh, and love for the comforts and conveniences of this world that we've become so accustomed to. We're so spoiled uh, that we don't, you know, we feel like we're doing God a favor if we go to church on Sunday morning. I say that. I say I'm afraid that sometimes uh, that becomes our mindset. Uh, maybe not to you, I hope not, but to many professing Christians. Uh, and so we we are really you know we do we don't want to be we don't want to be inconvenienced uh, much less be persecuted even though scripture second timothy uh what is it chapter uh two verse thirteen i believe it says uh if you're gonna live the Christian life, you will be persecuted uh all who would live a faithful godly life in Christ, Jesus as a Christian, will be persecuted. Are you being persecuted? I doubt it. Am I being persecuted? Hardly. Uh, and so we need to we need to realize that sometimes the enemies are not those outside of, of the church and our Christian uh, circle and even our own lives, but it's ourselves and the things that sometimes prevent us. Okay. <clears throat> Now, he, he refers to the fact that the, those Jewish opposition had been keeping them, Paul and his missionary uh, team, from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved from presenting the gospel, from evangelizing, we would say, the, the, the Gentiles. Uh, and and uh, he says, as a result, they, uh, referring to the opposition, the Jewish opposition, they are constantly filling up their sins to the limit, and wrath has overtaken them at last. There's a lot in these verses. I'm convinced that the, <clears throat> you know, I don't try to classify sins as being, and I think it's dangerous to do so, all sin, any sin uh, is sufficient to send the sinner to hell if he does not repent, turn away from any other hope for forgiveness and, and, and acceptance by God other than his reliance and faith upon and trust in the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. That's what we have to put our faith in, not anything we can do. Uh, but uh, I'm convinced that, that a great sin, um, so serious, is doing anything that hinders lost people from hearing the gospel, from responding to the gospel, from 
putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, I thought about uh, what Jesus himself said in Matthew, recorded in Matthew 23, verse 13, uh, where it says, uh, Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He was talking to the same uh, category of Jewish relig religious leaders of his time and of Paul's day who were opposing uh, the Christianity and opposing Christians. He said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of God in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. He's saying, not only have you rejected Jesus Christ and the gospel, and you're refusing to put your faith and trust and recognition and hope uh, for acceptance by God in Jesus Christ, <clears throat> who this is Jesus speaking to him, uh, but you're preventing others from uh, receiving the gospel and responding to the gospel. What could be the worst? This is uh, where, Paul, where Jesus was pronouncing woes uh, upon uh, the Jewish leadership. Okay, he does say, your sins are building up to the limit. What is the limit? The limit. Um, he says, and wrath has already overtaken you. Some of them uh, were already paying for their sins. Uh, the limit. I don't know what the limit is. Uh, God uh, is gracious, loving, slow to anger, anxious to forgive. That's recorded many times in Scripture, particularly the Old Testament. Uh, but there is a limit. There is a limit. Back, back when, uh, after way back in the time of Noah and the the flood, uh, Jesus uh, it says in. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, it says, And then the Lord said, My spirit will not all, always contend or strive with man forever. In other words, he's in that, at that point, he destroyed everything on earth. He said, Noah, and, and he, he uh, led to build an ark and preserve him and his family and the uh, animals that uh, he instructed Noah to put in the ark. And, and be saved from the great flood. Uh, but there is a limit. It's mentioned there in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. There's a limit. I don't know what it is. Uh, you don't know. We don't want to flirt with that limit, or God will just take us out. Even even Christians. I think even Christians uh, can, can sometimes send to the limit, and if they don't repent uh, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which uh, God will, when, when Christians sin, God will convict us. He won't let us sin indefinitely in comfort and, and without uh, conviction. He will c convict us stronger and stronger and stronger until we either repent or He just He just takes us out of this life. Uh, and that, that would be our limit here. Well, let me read on. I'm running out of time already. But uh, let me read verse 17. But as for us, brothers and sisters, after we were forced to leave you for a short time in person, not in our hearts, we greatly desired and made every effort to return to you and see you face to face. So we wanted to come to you, you and I, Paul, time and time again, but Satan hindered us. He, 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 Paul had wanted to go, go back to Thessalonica <clears throat> between the time he had left there and the time he's writing this, and it could have been... Uh, it could have been a year or two. Don't know exactly how long. This was one of his early writings uh, to the Thessalonians. But uh, there had been some time. He said, I wanted to come back to you, but Satan hindered it. Uh, Satan, that's Satan's is in the business of hindering, hindering the work of God, the work of Jesus, hindering people from, from com coming to saving faith in Christ. And then after, after he loses us, when we do become, we do, are, are born again through faith in Jesus, become a Christian, become in, and dwell with the Holy Spirit, he still hinders us. Satan still tries to hinder us every way from sharing the gospel, from living as a Christian, from ministering to people, from 
uh, being a vehicle, a vessel of God's love, he hinders us. That's what's called spiritual warfare. There was a, a, a sentence in this this teaching material that says, <clears throat> says um, that spiritual warfare is, here it is, daily life for the Christian is a matter of spiritual warfare. And that's true. If we're not experiencing the hindrance of Satan, that's not a good sign. That's a bad sign. If we're not doing anything that bothers Satan, uh, that he would have reason to hinder us, we're, we're shirking our Christian responsibility, our Christian witness, our ministry, our faithfulness. So uh, we need to expect it, uh, and we need to be concerned if we're not experiencing it from time to time. Because he's trying to, Satan is constantly trying to derail the uh, work of God and the spread of the gospel of Christ. Uh, now, then he says in verse 20 and 20, 19 and 24, Who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord at his coming? Is it not you? You indeed are our glory and joy. He's bragging on the Thessalonians. He's saying that they, uh, because of their acceptance of the gospel, because of their uh, becoming, uh, growing in Christian discipleship and in spreading the gospel and in resisting uh, Satan and his hindrances and in, in uh, standing up under the persecution they were receiving, he's saying that you, you enable us to be able to boast, not about ourselves, but about your progress in God uh, and in God's work in you. Uh, he was boasting. Uh, he was, Paul was boasting about the Christians in Thessalonica, and I know that the boasting that he had was uh, resonating in the heart of God. God, uh, God was pleased. He was proud of the growth, the conversion, and the growth of the Thessalonians. I wonder about that to us today. Can God boast about me? You say, well, I don't know that God does. Well, yeah, he, he did. Remember when in the book of Job in the Old Testament, uh, it records that, that God... Uh, was in in his heavenly throne and he was engaging with angels and about that time Satan came by and and God just pointed out and he asked Satan have you noticed my servant Job down on earth he asked Job where he'd been and Job said oh, I've been down on earth going here and there and looking at different things and people and, and God said why well, have you noticed my faithful servant Job how he he shuns evil, and he's faithful uh, to me. He's steadfast in his faith. And uh, that, that's the introduction that leads on to God giving Satan permission for Job, for uh, Satan permission to attack Job and, and his possessions and his family uh, because Satan would say, ah, he just, he just serves you because you, you've protected him with, and you've You've shielded him from any adversity, and God said, "No, no. okay, I'll let you. I'll let you bring adversity on." But God was proud of Job, and even though Job went through a serious time of testing and of questions, uh, in the end, in the in in a chapter of Job, uh, he he recognized God and what he had learned through that difficult experience, and God blessed him over and over again more than he'd ever been blessed before. God would like to bless us that way and he wants to be proud of us. He will be pleased with us if we're faithful, if we're zealous for him, if we're fervent in our discipleship, in our spreading of the gospel, in our ministry of love in the name of Jesus to all that we come in contact with. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this Bible study today. May it challenge us, 
may it encourage us, may it convict us. Uh, I need that. I suspect that all who hear this Bible study need that to some extent. And I pray that you'll give us that. Give us the encouragement, the conviction, the review, the correction, the instruction in righteousness that you have promised your word brings. I claim your promise that your word, when it's shared, will not return void and will accomplish his purpose. I claim that for the people that hear this Bible study. In Jesus' name, amen.